Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second and final live event organized as part of the McGill World We Start a Heart 2022 campaign. We're a global initiative aiming to empower individuals to respond to a cardiac arrest. For those of you who don't know us, the McGill World We Start a Heart campaign is a student led, faculty supported global initiative started within the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences here at McGill University. Our main goal is to encourage people to act and give them the skills to respond to sudden cardiac arrest. We truly believe this to be an important public health investment and perhaps the most impactful approach to increasing the odds of survival from sudden cardiac arrest. My name is Carla Apostolova. I'm a third year medical student here at McGill and the chair of the World of Start a Heart 2022 campaign. I'm joined by Lauren Pullman, second year medical student at McGill University and the logistics lead of the McGill World of Start a Heart campaign and my co-moderator for today's panel. Lauren and I have the rare opportunity of being joined by three of the world's leading minds in pediatric cardiac care. Our guests today are experts in cardiovascular care and are dedicated to promoting awareness and education around out of hospital setting cardiac arrest. I'll start by introducing our speakers. So Dr. Mary McBride is a pediatric cardiac intensivist at Lurie Children's Hospital of Chicago. She's an associate professor of pediatrics and medical education at Northwestern University Feinberg School of Medicine. And she's on the board of directors of the Pediatric Cardiac Intensive Care Society and the former chair of the American Heart Association Pediatric Group. Welcome, Dr. McBride. Thank you for having me. Next is Dr. Catherine Allen, who's a research associate at St. Michael's Hospital in Toronto, Ontario. She specializes in arrhythmia research and focuses on sudden cardiac arrest in the young. She's the project manager and co-investigator for the Canadian Sudden Cardiac Arrest Network, or CSCAN and National Registry of Setting Cardiac Arrests. She's also the Chair of CARE, Cardiac Arrest Response and Education, an organization with the mission to increase survival from setting cardiac arrest. Welcome, Dr. Allen. Hi. Thank you. And lastly, we have Dr. Farhan Banji. So Farhan is the Vice Dean of Education here at the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences at McGill University. He's also a professor of pediatrics and an associate member of McGill's Institute of Health Sciences Education. At the Montreal Children's Hospital, he's an attending physician in the Pediatric Critical Care Unit, where he's also a trauma team leader and ECMO physician. Hi, Farhan. Carla, uh, thank you for inviting me. To set the tone for this event, I'd like to first share a video created by members of our student and steering committees during the 2020 campaign on how to respond to cardiac arrest. In the next 60 seconds, I invite you to watch this video and learn how to save a life. In Canada alone, every 12 minutes, someone suffers from a cardiac arrest. If you don't do anything, they are going to die. In the next 60 seconds, we're going to teach you how to save a life. If you see someone lying unconscious, the first thing you want to do is check if they're responsive. If they are not responsive and not breathing or breathing abnormally, they are likely suffering from a cardiac arrest. Call 911. Let them know that someone suffered from a cardiac arrest. Send someone to find an AD if there's one nearby, and then start chest compressions. For chest compressions, find the center of the chest, put your dominant hand down, interlock your fingers, and push hard and push fast. Using an AD is really easy. You just apply the pads, turn on the machine, and follow the voice instruction. The machine will analyze the rhythm and tell you if a shock is recommended. What a great video. Um, okay, so we chose to address a pediatric perspective in the, in the conversation on sudden cardiac arrest awareness and education because we felt that this is a topic that has only really in the last few years become popularized. Sudden cardiac arrest, although it can happen to anyone at any time and in any place, is often thought of as an adult problem and that the solution lies exclusively within the adult population. But in 2017, CPR training was made mandatory by the Quebec government for all secondary three or grade nine students throughout the province, which really recognized the role the youth play in saving lives from cardiac arrest. The ACT Foundation is the national charitable organization dedicated to establishing CPR and defibrillator training programs free for students in high schools across Canada. Dr. Allen, in your opinion, referencing some of the amazing work you've done in promoting CPR education in children through care, why is it important for kids and teens to learn CPR and how to use an AD? 
That's a really great question. Um, there's a number of different reasons why I think it's really important that children and teens learn how to, how to do CPR and use an AED. So one thing we know is that children are great multipliers. So whatever they learn in school, they're often going to go home and teach their family, teach their friends. So it's a great way of teaching many people how to do CPR, not just the kids. Um, a second thing we know is that in countries where this has been legislated um, in schools, we do know that they then see over time a huge increase in the rates of bystander CPR. So it's a great way of educating a generation of lifesavers that will hopefully grow up, be comfortable stepping in in the emergency state and providing CPR. Thank you. And that's the goal. It's really training the next generation and having them come home and then share the message with their family members and friends. Um, thank you very much for that response. So there are many stories of children saving their family members or teachers' lives by performing CPR, which further solidifies the notion that children are an asset and an important link to amplify CPR efforts and reduce mortality from out-of-hospital cardiac arrest. As Dr. Allen has just pointed out, many supports are in place to educate children on CPR and more and more authorities are beginning to recognize children as a crucial audience for resuscitation education. So Farhan, as TPR education slowly but surely begins to disseminate across youth globally, what would you say are some of the important limitations and considerations to keep in mind while teaching children CPR as opposed to adults? I think first and foremost, you have to think about the cognitive ability of children as well as their size, right? And young children can learn some of the principles of, of resuscitating and saving a life. So, so children as young as four to six can start to learn about when to call an ambulance. When there's a medical emergency, how do I, how do I activate emergency medical services? It takes until about, probably not age-related, but weight-related, around 40 to 50 kilos before kids are able to produce high quality CPR, that's probably around the age of 10 to 12. So if I was taking one chance to teach children to do CPR, I would focus it somewhere around that 10 to 12 year uh, age range. Now, the important thing to keep in mind is that CPR skills decay with time. So it's probably more important to teach kids a little bit every year, maybe half an hour, 20 minutes, and then do that regularly rather than doing a four hour course. And the other thing is access to people. And so our students at World Restart Heart have done a fantastic job of thinking about the epidemiology and, and logistics in, in, in Canada. In Canada, the majority of people, over two thirds go to university. So World Restart Heart has targeted university students because that's a large proportion of people and their parents who may be having cardiac arrests uh, when they're in their twenties of the students they can actually act and do something in that time. So I think it's important for each organization or country to think about its own demographics, its own educational program, how often they can teach, and then some of the limitations to what kids can do. And the World Health Organization has actually endorsed this, that kids save lives and that we should be doing this. Absolutely. And I think it's really important to make it engaging and fun for kids so that they not only learn how to do it, but they'll remember it and they'll keep these memories with them and feel really comfortable and remember how to perform CPR if that's ever needed. Great point. So thank you. So children are vastly different from adults as we had just mentioned in terms of cognitive function and what they remember. And so both from an anatomical and a physiological point of view, these are different. From the perspective of the general population, kids are often thought of as small adults or tiny humans. So when discussing cardiac arrest, real and important differences exist between the pediatric and the adult populations. In young people, sudden cardiac arrest is rare, but it is possible. 2,000 seemingly healthy young people under the age of 25 die from a sudden cardiac arrest in the United States each year, which is truly 2,000 too many than we would like to see. And so that's what we're trying to do to try and bring awareness to that. So Dr. McBride, as a pediatric cardiac intensivist, can you tell us how sudden cardiac arrest in children differs from sudden cardiac arrest in adults? And specifically in terms of the prevalence, the risk factors, and the most common causes that you see in your practice as an intensivist. Absolutely. So as you mentioned, it is a very rare event. And it's a very rare event in everyone, but certainly more so in children. 
um, the types of problems that can lend itself to being a victim of sudden cardiac arrest are often things that children are born with and not something that has happened over the course of time because of lifestyle choices. And, and those things can also impact an adult as well, but um, there are things that impact adults that don't tend to impact children. And so um, typically things that children are born with that can put them at risk is something like congenital heart disease, where the, the heart doesn't form correctly when um, the child was a fetus and the heart was forming very early in fetal life. Um, there also can be problems with the conduction system or the, the, the electrical wiring with inside the heart. Um, either there is, um, you know, a, a, a chemical or, uh, like we all learned about, uh, in chemistry class, different ions that can float around inside the heart, uh, the channels or the gates that open up from those different ions can be abnormal. Um, these are, can be, these can be things that can be genetically acquired or passed on from person to person, but. Unfortunately, oftentimes the initial presentation or the first time we know that there's something wrong is when a child presents having already arrested. And so, you know, if we have the opportunity to know that beforehand, we can do different things like medications or um, devices to help protect a child or an adult. But oftentimes things are well past uh, where we would ever want them to be when we learn of this. And so it's, it's usually something with the structure of the heart itself or the structure of the conduction system or the thickness of the muscle of the pumping chambers or things like that, as opposed to lifestyle choices that lend themselves to high blood pressures and high cholesterol and things of that nature. Absolutely. Thank you for that. And I also think that we can even try to see if we can make efforts in that sense to train people whose loved ones or friends and family members have those known heart defects so that in case something does happen, which we can't control, as you said, if they are known to have a congenital defect, that they'll be ready to act if need be. Building on uh, what Dr. McBride has shared, Dr. Allen, you have an extensive background in cardiac arrest and resuscitation research, and your interests are really centered around understanding incidence, etiology, and familial risk for sudden cardiac arrest in young individuals, along with their family members. One of the leading causes of sudden cardiac death in the young is a condition by the name of sudden arrhythmic death syndrome, which simply put is when a child has a normal heart and a presumed undiagnosed arrhythmia. For people who aren't in healthcare and may not be familiar with this condition and others that may cause sudden cardiac arrest, can you explain the spectrum of conditions that may lead to sudden cardiac arrest in children and why it's sometimes very difficult to diagnose them? Sure. I mean, Dr. McBride has already done a nice um, description of the conditions, but as she very elegantly pointed out, sudden arrhythmic death syndrome is when you have the problem with the electrical system of the heart. So the heart looks normal, but the defect is, is on a cell level and it causes the heart to go into these uh, abnormal rhythms. And then the other common um, type of condition that can cause it in children is called cardiomyopathy or basically the um, size um, of the heart is different than it should be. So the chambers are bigger or the heart muscle is thicker than it should be. And these also cause issues with the pumping action of the heart, and then also can cause um, the electrical system to go haywire. So you're absolutely right. I mean, in terms of trying to diagnose this, it, it can be difficult. So there are, you know, different ways to do that, um, you know, where they use an ECG and they put the stickies on your chest to see how the heart rhythm is doing. Um, sometimes they may look at the structure of the heart using a cardiac echo, so an ultrasound to look at, you know, how the structure is and how the heart is pumping. Um, and some of the European societies actually recommend that um, we do screen children for these conditions at a young age, but the best way to do that has not been decided on yet. Um, it's each of the different um, techniques that you can use all have their sort of pros and cons and they're not perfect. I'm not sure if that answers your question. That answers my question perfectly. Thank you. Moving towards um, more of an edu medical education perspective, Dr. McBride, uh, being a pediatric cardiac intensivist for over a decade, you're someone who loves to care for children and to see children with cardiac defects get well, go home, and become active and healthy adults one day. But aside from caring for children, you're also very involved in teaching medical trainees. 
Today, simulation learning is widely and successfully used to train learners and is especially useful to practice difficult, rare, and high acuity cases. Can you comment on how simulation learning has impacted medical education in general, as well as more specifically in cardiac critical care? And along with that, can you also share how the framework for teaching medical trainees has evolved over the years? Absolutely, what a great question. Um, I'm certainly passionate about the use of simulation. Uh, the reason why I think is because um, as you guys are experiencing as medical students now, right? You spend a lot of time in the classroom, a lot of time reading, a lot of time having conversation and all that's really important. And it provides a, a beautiful groundwork to what lays ahead. And um, you know, we talk in medical education about this uh, pyramid of framework of, you know, does, uh, or knows, knows how, shows. And so simulation gets us to the part where you start to take that information that you've learned in the classroom and you can apply it to a patient scenario without having to actually practice on a patient. And so in particular for those situations that are really dramatic and sometimes traumatic, uh, they don't happen very often, but when they do happen, it is best for everyone involved to be prepared before it even begins to take place. And so simulation offers that opportunity to have a planned emergency um, where you can hit a timeout button or press pause and have a conversation about what's happening, what everyone's thinking about, what everyone's worrying about, um, and start to uh, take into consideration the system in which we're providing care for that child. So can everyone hear each other? Does everyone know who's in charge? You know, where is the defibrillator? Uh, can we get the pads on the patient? Where do they go? Those sorts of things are often overlooked from a classroom perspective perspective, because there's so many other things that you have to learn. But simulation gives you that opportunity to practice it. And if you know any of you out there have been, um, you know, grew up playing sports or grew up playing a musical instrument, the way that you became an expert or pretended in my case to be an expert at one of those things is that you had practice and you had practice regularly. And so this concept of deliberate practice or practicing in a very specific way that you can do over and over, and you can um, reinforce those steps that you did well, and then kind of reroute those steps that didn't go as, as planned so that you're ready for that day when it happens. And it also is an opportunity to practice when you're not really stressed out, because when something like that happens, even to those of us who live in that environment all the time, it's still very stressful uh, to be working on someone's child. And so to be able to have those steps and those, those, you know, muscle memory in your mind of where your hands are going to go and what you're going to say and what you should be thinking about before you're emotional and before you're stressed is a really nice way to be prepared for those moments in real life. And in uh, medical Oh, please go ahead. I was just going to say in medical school, we have a lot of simulations on adults, but in pediatrics, like you said, there's that added layer of anxiety and stress. And so incorporating more pediatric simulation is definitely um, something to be considered in, in medical curriculums. Thank you for Absolutely. Your so Farhan, as the newly appointed Vice Dean of Education at the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences here at McGill, you are a valued and appreciated mentor and teacher to us all. And you've contributed immensely, contributed immensely to education, innovation, and the development of teaching and learning at McGill, especially in the simulation center, like Dr. McBride had said and how it's so important and crucial to our learning. Over the years, you have contributed many of your efforts to resuscitation education and developing strategies to improve the quality of resuscitative care and ultimately the odds of survival from cardiac arrest. So how is resuscitation education being implemented in medical curriculums today? And can you comment on the scarcity of pediatric resuscitation training in the curriculum as Carla had previously alluded to? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. And I think what we do a good job at is we ask our students when they come into health professions education, so medicine, nursing, OT, PT, communication sciences, we ask them to, to do their CPR training, um, often in other programs as well in, in, in healthcare dentistry. What we don't do a great job of at is um, maintaining that over time. So medical students, all nursing students, all have their CPR training but go around and ask practicing students how many of them have upkept their CPR skills. And the thing that we forget is healthcare changes all around us. We don't become 
discompetent by forgetting what we learned is because medicine, healthcare changes around us with time. So what I learned 20 years ago doesn't apply today. And so you have to constantly upkeep. And especially for things that are psychomotor skills, you really got to practice them. So I see, I see the, the, what we do well is at that entry level. What we do poorly is ongoing for the 30 years of practice of many of our practitioners. And we have to think about that continued professional development and maintain it. And many people argue, I'm, as healthcare providers, I'm not going to see an arrest or I'm not going to come across that. My feeling is this is something that the public critically wants from us. They want every physician, every nurse to step in in an emergency and help. It doesn't matter whether your background is in intensive care, emergency medicine, whether it is psychiatry or obstetrics. They want you to be able to be calm and to start and help there. A group that does this really well are our, car our colleagues and par uh, paramedics. They are inspired by this. They're motivated by this. They know what they do makes a huge difference in outcomes. They train, they compete, and they try to get better. And that's what we need to think about. Your question around pediatrics is really important. When we started teaching our medical students about pediatric resuscitation, I did ask around the country and, and nobody was really doing this. If you think of emergency medicine physicians, in Canada at least, and probably true for the United States, about 85% of children that are seen in emergency departments are seen in general emergency departments, not pediatric hospitals. So general emergency physicians will look after them. When they graduate from training, emergency medicine physicians feel really competent and confident in their ability to manage a, a critically ill adult. Same question for children. They are scared. They are not comfortable. They don't want to manage that. And I think that's a failing of the healthcare system of our educational system. So as Dr. McBride's spoken about, we need to do more simulation. It's a rare event. How do we get people practice on what they need to do? And the last thing I'd say is we're actually not thinking as an educational system or a learning institution. In order for good outcomes to happen for, for children and adults in cardiac arrest or critically ill, we need competence of individuals. So that's the training of the individuals. We need competence of teams. That's the training and simulation of how you work with each other. And we need competence of systems so that we know that the equipment's in the place that we thought it was. We know that we practice in that environment. And that learning system is one that not only thinks about the educational events, but also real events. At our hospital, we now debrief every trauma, every resuscitation, whether that's in the OR, whether that's in the ICU, whether that's in the eMERGE, to try to learn from it. Non-judgmental, safe environment. Let's take this and how do we get ourselves better? So I think that's the future of education. And what I'm most proud of is the next generation of learners will be really open and trained for that with all the work they're doing in simulation and the way that you think about improving the world that's going to help us as you become practicing physicians, because you're used to this being as a learning opportunity, not as a threat to somebody's individual competence. Absolutely. And I think fostering an environment where people feel safe to open up what they're not sure about and have open and honest discussions will not only make us better future practitioners, but also will ultimately help the patients and their families in the long run. So I think creating that safe space is absolutely crucial. And it's fantastic that we started doing that here at McGill. And I hope that that is something that will be implemented in other institutions as well. So earlier in the talk, we touched upon the Quebec legislation, which made CPR education mandatory in high schools for grade nine or secondary three students. However, that law only specifies this mandate for public high schools and is only unique to Quebec specifically which leaves out many children across the country and even in our own province. So Dr. Allen, what are some of the other ways that we can access and empower young people to save lives with AEDs and CPR? And how can we ensure that young people who learn CPR in high school or early in life feel empowered to perform high quality CPR if presented with the opportunity, even if it happens several years later in life? And on that same note, um, is there anything that has been implemented or is in the talks of being implemented in Ontario? 
Yeah, really, really great question. Um, and it's a tough one. So in Ontario, for example, uh, CPR and AD training has been mandatory in the grade nine um, physical health and education. But as we suspected and had heard sort of anecdotally from, you know, other parents and people is that it's it's just not happening. I mean, if you look at the curriculum, it's one small paragraph. It doesn't really explain how to do that training. Um, you know, teachers have a lot to teach during the year. So it could be something that they just don't have time um, to, to fit in because a traditional CPR certification course um, can take quite a while, right? If you're going to do it properly, it could be, you know, a day or two days. And so for a teacher who has very little time, um, that's hard to fit into the curriculum. So one of the things uh, we've been talking about in Ontario, and I'm and probably, I'm sure others have as well, is that, you know, if we're really going to change the needle on trying to um, educate more people and more children, I, I think we need to get creative about how we're going to do it. So uh, we are actually going to be pilot testing a new way to teach kids uh, how to do CPR and use AEDs. It's video-based learning. They do have uh, mannequins to practice on, but it's more of an education awareness piece, and you can do it in one class period. So we're hoping, you know, this will be, um, to, you know, schools will be very interested in this because it really cuts down on the time don't have to have a certified instructor to teach it. The teacher can do it themselves. So it overcomes a lot of the barriers that we know about um, for schools to actually implement it into practice. So I would encourage, you know, any youth or kids to just watch a video. You know, there's plenty of really good videos on YouTube that you can watch. Anybody can learn how to save a life. You do not need to take a course to do that. So that would be um, my advice. And we don't really have any legislation um, ongoing. Um, we are thinking about that and what the best way is to make this better implemented across Ontario. So I think once we've piloted the program and shown that it can work, our plan is to go back to government and to advocate very strongly that, you know, there's a gap it's not being taught as it should be. How can we fix this? Absolutely. And I think from experience, especially what I always remember most in my training is what I see and being able to have hands on experience. So I think, especially in younger kids, they remember most what they were physically able to do. So I think that being able to actually go into schools and watch videos and be able to practice on the mannequins will be something that they will remember and that they can hopefully take with them for a long time. Dr. McBride. An important part of working with children is also collaborating with their family members and ensuring that they're involved and engaged in their child's care. Family becomes especially important in the recovery process. Can you tell us what the recovery process from a sudden cardiac arrest in children resembles and what maybe post-cardiac arrest syndrome means and what the outcomes are like following an arrest? Absolutely. Um, so po post-cardiac arrest care is definitely an evolving field. Um, depending on the severity and really uh, the duration of the arrest and the amount of other organs that have been injured, particularly the brain, it, it kind of dictates what that rehabilitative course looks like. Um, and so in the immediate post cardiac arrest, after we've gotten um, a resuscitating rhythm back, we're really trying hard to make sure that all the organs in the body are as safe and as protected as possible. So making sure that we're getting um, a good amount of oxygen through their lungs and circulated through the rest of their body, making sure that we're maintaining, you know, a good blood pressure and, and as much cardiac output as we can, good blood flow up to the brain and into the other vital organs, um, making sure that the sugar doesn't get too high and making sure that the salts are okay. We're being uh, very obsessive compulsive about every little data point we can possibly uh, pay attention to. Um, and then, um, typically once, once there's stability from an oxygenation and blood pressure standpoint, we're then focused on what has happened to the brain and has the brain been injured? And is there a way that we can help, uh, that person recover whatever damage has been done? And so once they're more stable, then it's a matter of, um, you know, helping them if they've had an, an injury to their motor area of their brain, where they need some rehabilitation to help them with, with strength or with movement or to recover um, another part of the body to do a different part of the body's job, uh, those sorts of things. And, and obviously in particular with children, 
um, as much as I adore children, they don't always adore me back. Right. And so, you know, a three-year-old is going to want their mother helping them uh, with their stretches and getting out of bed or, or their father. I don't mean to be uh, so disparaging of our poor fathers, um, but a parent or a loved one at their bedside, helping them those sorts of things. Once they're more awake, they are definitely not going to want me around. Um, and so, it, you know, depending on what sort of injuries have been sustained um, thereafter, there will be physical therapy and occupational therapy and potentially speech therapy, maybe even a rehab facility, uh, maybe outpatient care and appointments. Um, so there's a whole host of potential injuries that happen. And, you know, to the, to the global point of this conversation, the faster we are able to uh, restore cardiac output, uh, by the means of bystander response and AED use and contacting of emergency medical services, you know, time is brain cells and the brain is something that isn't as forgiving as some of our other organs. And so the most important thing to do is to try to get blood flow to the brain. And so all of these things that we've been talking about will help dictate down the road what the outcome is of that arrest. And sadly, with as much as we've been learning over the course of the last few decades, we haven't made too many strides in improvement cardiac arrest outcomes. You know, in the inpatient setting, or excuse me, in the outpatient setting of an out of hospital cardiac arrest, um, it's still, you know, about 10, 20% of kids will survive. And in the in hospital arrest, it's, it's not quite half, even with all the technologies and, and everything that we've learned just in my short career thus far. And so we still have opportunities to be better. And, you know, it is my bias, in my opinion, that the faster we can recognize someone becoming sick and the faster we can help restore uh, good blood flow throughout their body is, is our opportunity to really make a difference for these kids. And like you mentioned, we think of cardiac arrest as being a cardiac event, but it's just as much a neurological um, or brain event. Um, a follow-up question would be, is there a time period uh, once the child is resuscitated, that is critical to be, to watch for the child, to be vigilant of any possible, um, adverse, adverse events. Absolutely. You know, we talk, uh, you know, in particular about the brain and, and the first 72 hours after injury of watching for evolution of that injury. Um, and while that is true, I think it depends on what else has gone wrong, what else has been injured and how long it takes for those other organ systems to recover before we're really out of the woods. Um, and as long as someone's in the intensive care unit and has foreign bodies like monitoring lines and breathing tubes, there are always risks of infections um, and other things that can happen to people in the intensive care unit. So um, it just kind of depends on how sick they become, how quickly uh, they re can recover and, and what kind of uh, persistent injury that we need to deal with. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So we've now reached the Q&A portion of our event. Um, over the past few days, our student committee has been collecting questions in preparation for this event, and we've compiled a list. I'll be directing them to um, our invited guests and experts. The first one is for Dr. Allen. Um, you alluded to this a little bit in the previous question, but where do you envision CPR training in youth and overall AED access being in 10 years from now, both on a local and national scale? And are there any legislations or government incentives that we can expect in the upcoming years? So really, really great question. Um, I definitely think that, you know, training 10 years from now is probably all mostly going to be digital based. I think a lot of it is going to be gamification. You know, it's all online, video based, um, those kinds of things. There's tremendous amount of um, apps out there on your phone that you can just, you know, download an app, learn how to do um, CPR. Uh, smartwatches actually might be another thing as, you know, more people get them, they can create apps for them basically that will give you feedback. And it's, it's great because of the positioning, you'll be able to see your watch and then see how you're actually performing in real time. Um, there are also apps that you can use your phone as well um, to help you uh, know if you're doing good quality chest compressions. I just, I wonder about logistics of trying to put a phone on somebody's chest and then... <laughs> pump away and not have it fall off. But um, so technology, I think, is really going to help us to at least, you know, get more people aware, more people educated, more people trained, make it easier for them um, to use CPR. And in terms of AED accessibility, um, another great question, the technology on AEDs is just 
it's just amazing right now. Um, there's a new AED that's not yet um, approved by Health Canada, but it is, I think, in the market in Europe. Um, it's basically about this big. You stick it on your wall, essentially. Um, it's a one-time use. Um, just break it in half, and then you stick those halves on as pads, and then it it basically acts like a normal AED. And the price point is meant to be around maybe $200, $300 maximum, which is a huge decrease down from your typical AED costs at least $1,500 to $2,000. So, and they're hoping to actually get the price down to about $100. So with that, pretty much anyone can have an AED anywhere. It's very portable. You could have one in my purse that I could walk around with. So I think, um, you know, that's going to be a huge game changer in terms of AED accessibility. And um, in terms of legislation in Ontario, we actually just, uh, our group CARE and, and the Heart and Stroke and others were very instrumental in convincing our government um, to create a mandatory provincial AED registry. So, you know, before this, everyone sort of all had their own different registries, but there was no complete understanding of where are all the AEDs in the province located. So with this new registry, when it goes into effect, essentially um, both the public We'll be able to access that data and EMS, so everyone will know where all these AEDs are. And it also, the legislation um, will mandate certain places that should have AEDs installed if they're not already. Um, so schools might be one of them, um, airports, you know, high traffic areas, etc. So I think the future is bright. Um, I do think there's a lot of work we have to do in advocating for this in our own respective provinces with government, but. Yeah, technology, I think, is going to be a huge game changer in the next five years. Having a pocket AED would completely eliminate the issue of accessibility. And then it just becomes up to the user to know how to use it. And it's becoming simpler and simpler as, as new AEDs come out and as we raise awareness on how easy it is to perform chest compressions and use an AED. That's awesome. Absolutely. And on that same note, also, I think implementing policies where in larger work environments, even where there are AEDs, making it known, for example, when someone gets hired, that that is where an AED should be found when need be so that everyone in a large environment can know where something is in case they need to act and not just have a registry. So make it known, verbalize it, show it. I think that's really, really important as well. So just before you move on to yeah. the next question, I think it's very cool that, you know, just the work that our students have done have, have worked with the Fondation Jacques de Champlain. And, you know, in Quebec, we don't have that registry yet, but they have an app that helps us to figure out where the AEDs are. And for our audience, they may want to go and download that app. Um, and we're fortunate to have Francois de Champlain working on our steering committee and helping to promote that. And, and I think that's been really, really, really important. And I, and I think trying to get towards that legislation that our students and Francois will work towards. Absolutely, and fantastic work has been done. Even McGill now has a registry on their website so that any student can log on and see where the AEDs are. And that's something that we're trying to promote to all the students on campus as well so that they can recognize where the AEDs are in case they need to be used. So to flip the switch a little bit, for Dr. McBride and Farhan, feel free to chime in if you have anything you'd like to add. What are some of the main takeaways with caring for kids, generally speaking, as opposed to adults? And then how can we apply these principles to lay people administering CPR on kids? I think that the, you know, Globally, what I said before applies not just to the heart, but a lot of times when there's a problem with kids, it has to do with something that they were born with, as opposed to lifestyle choices. Um, and I think that, you know, in doing work with, with the American Heart Association and simulation and being a cardiologist, what I've learned is that trying something is so much better than trying nothing. And, you know, we all worry, you know, certainly as, as parents, as siblings, as healthcare providers, um, we, none of us want to hurt anybody, right? We all got into the work that we're doing because we care about people and we care about their outcomes and, and how, and their health and doing something, even if you do it wrong is so important. Um, obviously ideal would be to, to learn the proper way of doing CPR and making sure that you're getting as much blood flow around the body. But, um, even 
just trying it, even if you're, if you're doing it wrong is, is a potential to help somebody, um, in a really impactful way. Absolutely. And I think that that's something that we are trying to bring to the general population, especially students on McGill campus, is that even if you don't think you're comfortable doing chest compressions, if you know how to do it and you think that there's a need for it, do it anyways. Even if it's not perfect, being able to act and try something is better than not trying at all. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think that's great. Really well said, Lauren. You know, the one the one thing that I would say that's worthwhile for our public to, uh, to understand or the people that are watching this is, you know, pediatric cardiac arrests are often, and when they're out of hospital, related to something else happening, and then the child's heart stops. So it might be a drowning, it might be a, a massive infection, it might be any number of things that, that happen, but they're not getting blood around to their body. They either have too low oxygen in their blood, or their heart's not getting the blood out to the rest of the body. So it's called a, an asphyxial arrest. The difference with that is that conventional CPR um, maybe better and conventional. What I mean by that is mouth to mouth as well as compressions. And so, you know, if you're going to be caring for children, um, it's worthwhile to take a proper CPR course or CPR anytime type things that also teach you about the mouth to mouth as well as the compressions. That's a little bit different, um, you know, where I think we say anyone can do CPR for, for an adult in a sudden cardiac arrest and compression only is the way you want to go there unless you've been you know, trained differently. So that that's important to think about. And you know, the, the other thing is, I, I don't think we as a pediatric community necessarily um, give ourselves a credit that, that, that actually is deserved. And, and Dr. McBride talked about how sudden cardiac arrest in the community, the survival really hasn't changed. But when it happens in hospital, it has. And it's almost, I think it's actually more than quadrupled over 30, 35 years. Um, it's not because there's some magical new drug. It's because we watch children, we know when that arrest is coming, we put them into the right places. When, when those things happen, we treat them appropriately. And then we look at those events afterwards and try to improve. And those are the types of things that will help with cardiac arrest and a very different in hospital than out of hospital. Um, but there are, there are ways to improve what we do. And, and like Dr. McBride said, we, we want to be at 100%. Um, and that's where we you know, kick ourselves. But we are making strides and that's important to keep in mind. Absolutely. And as you had mentioned earlier, with regards to healthcare professionals, being able to train people, even if it's 20 minutes, not a four hour or two day course in feeling comfortable to act and knowing the difference between wanting to use just compressions, when to use compressions and breath, the difference between adults and pediatric populations. If that's done in a crash course format or done in short intervals throughout a longer period of time, that can be a way that more people can have access to CPR training, which is very important. Lots of exciting things to look forward in the future. Um, we've reached the end of this amazing event. Dr. McBride, Dr. Allen and Farhan, thank you all so much for your efforts in promoting the importance of CPR. And most importantly, thank you for your time and for being here. Um, for more information on our live events and some of the in-person events that we're hosting in the coming weeks, please make sure to visit our social media and our website, mcgill.ca forward slash raw. Uh, it's been a true pleasure to have you all here today. Thank you once again. Thank all of you. Thank you. Thank you for inviting us.